Clay Shirky is a media analyst who likes to say that institutions tend to preserve the problem they were created to solve. Institutions tend to preserve the problem they were created to solve. My argument today is that almost everything we know about as education and work today is actually an institution that was evolved and created for the last information age, the information age of the 19th century that came with industrialization. Okay. So we have a big job ahead. Our job is to remake the institutions of education and work for our age, not for the one we inherited, to as um, somebody, I'm not sure if it was David or, or who said, but institutions for our children's and our students' future, not for our past. And institutions tend to preserve the problems they were created to solve. So we have a challenge. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to begin with a big historical overview, then a little exercise we're going to do together, a three-part exercise, two parts at the beginning and one at the very end of my talk. Um, then um, I'm going to do a sort of history of 19th century education and immediately look to a new model, a, a more contemporary model of, um, of education and what we can start doing as individuals within the institutions that are trying to preserve a lot of 19th century um, uh, forms for the industrial age. So here's the big overview. Uh, historian Robert Darton says in all of human history, all of human history, there have been four information ages. By that he means in all of human history, there have been four times when a technology has so radically changed the way we communicate and interact with one another that there is simply no turning back. When he says that, he goes back to 4000 BC, ancient Mesopotamia, remember the birthplace of, of civilization, cradle of civilization, to the invention of writing. Because once you can write, once you have a technology of writing, it's not just hearsay. Writing is about saying, remember when you told me how much this camel cost last year? You said it would cost this much, and I have the proof. It's written down. I have the proof. It changes the way you can communicate. It changes legacy, interaction, everything about human communication, including transportability. I can write something down, give it to you. You can carry it someplace else. I don't have to be face to face. Right? Writing evolved very slowly. And by the time of, great, of the great classical era of Greece, um, ancient Greece, uh, the Greek alphabet was being written down, was being finalized. That, that's when the diacritical mark that makes the translation between sound and writing was invented. Socrates, the great philosopher Socrates, was walking the earth, and he hated writing. He didn't like it. He said, writing ruins your memory. It makes you distracted. It hurts the brilliance of the intimacy of relationship one person to another. And it reduces the complexity of associational dialogical thinking to something that I happen to write down now. <coughs> right? What if I change my mind? Because I've met somebody smarter who helps me to change my mind. I've already committed this thing to writing. What a travesty. What a travesty of thought, what a distraction, what a terrible violation of humanity to have writing as an invention. Fortunately, Socrates had a very good student named Plato who wrote that down, or we would not know what Socrates thought about writing. Second great information age occurs, and this is a surprise to many people unless you happen to be Chinese, occurs in China in the 10th century. Doesn't happen in, in Europe, we read about, in, in, we, if you're a European, you read about this in our history books, that, it, that movable type was invented by Gutenberg in the Renaissance, right? Took five centuries for movable type to come from China to Europe, but then we discovered it, right? About the same time we discovered America, actually. Um, that was a joke. <laughs> anyway, um, but in Europe, not everybody thought movable type was great, right? If you were part of the scriptorium, Right, that the church and the state had sanctioned to hand write the great illuminated manuscripts, you didn't like the movable type. You thought movable type was a violation of authority. It ruined the primacy of the words. It distracted people and maybe even hurt their memory. 
third information age is the one we've inherited, and it happens to be my old scholarly field. And that's what happens with the invention of steam-powered presses, machine-made paper, and ink around the time of the American Revolution. Uh, a long time ago, I wrote a book called Revolution in the Word that was actually about the first generation of American readers because that invention of, move, of um, steam-powered presses and machine-made paper and, and ink made books available to middle-class and working-class pe people for the first time in human history. Right? Uh, the most popular fo form of print of that era was the novel. Right? People who were reading for the first time and could own a book for the first time wanted novels. They wanted stories. They wanted wild stories of pirates and seduction and horrors and scary people and ventriloquists and charlatans and all kinds of interesting magicians, all kinds of interesting people. Guess what the founding fathers thought about, uh, thought, thought about cheap books? They were often called du duodecimo was the format. It was a cheap little mass-produced book. Hurt the memory, right? Cause distraction. Change the relationship to authority. Unfit young people for productive labor. And in fact, and this is where it gets interesting, the institution of taxpayer-supported, publicly funded, compulsory public education was supported from the beginning because it would be a great way of sh reshaping a populace that now couldn't get enough novels. Novels were basically the video games of the 18th, late 18th and 19th century. People were terrified about what young people were doing when they weren't watching. And in fact, this is a very silly reason to become the most one of the most famous people at Duke University, but I kind of am famous because I've discovered the pocket, right? How, how goofy is that? Um, I was reading a diary in 18th century. I wasn't interested in who wrote the literature as much as I was just interested in who read it. Who were the first readers? So I spent a lot of time looking through attics of historical societies. It took me about 10 years to try to make an ethnography of the first generation of readers. Interestingly, many of the first readers were also the first writers. There was a lot of similarities to bloggers. But in one of the diaries I was reading where somebody, her real name was, was Dolly, but she called herself Daisy in her diary because she thought that was a more novelistic name, described how she'd heard this thing. Pockets that in the 19th century were um, reticules. They were these little purses you wore on the outside of your dress or your pants, or they were patches. She said, I figured out a way from one of my friends that you can make a little declivity, quote unquote, declivity in the seam, and you can hide your novel in this and walk down the street. And everyone thinks you're a good little girl, but in fact, you've got a hidden novel. You're hiding this novel. So I went to one of the historical villages, I think, it was, I think it was Old Sturbridge we went to, and we started pulling costumes out. And sure enough, we kept finding these little handmade things in the seams of clothes that were designed, and the kids were telling each other how to hide your novels. It's not so different than the kind of conversations we're having now, right, about parental controls of technology, et cetera, et cetera. Fourth grade information age, April, 1993, the Mosaic 1.0 browser is commercialized and suddenly anyone who has access to the internet can not only have an idea, but can publish that idea. And anyone in the world can read it, right? Not just mass literacy, not just ability to buy books, but to publish your ideas anywhere in the world. It makes us distracted, it hurts our memory, right? It ruins our attention, it makes us lonely, it violates our relationship between one another. All of those things, we're hearing them again. But the interesting thing is, we now have institutions of higher education and work that were designed for the industrial age, and as I'm going to argue, very much for the Fordist, Taylorized, A, B, C, D, or all of the above world of the 19th century, when we now live in a world where there aren't A, B, C, D choices, but hundreds, thousands, millions of choices for any idea you might have. And you're not only receiving those ideas, you're making those ideas, right? You're contributing, you're communicating those ideas. What about our educational system prepares students today for being a contributor to that world, a wise citizen of that world, a participant in that world, right? 
Not so much, not so much. So I'm not gonna say any more. I'd like you each to take one of those cards and a pencil. There should be six on there. If anyone doesn't have one, there's some more cards and pencils at the back of the room. I promise you, you're gonna get to Anybody push the button at some point. Thank you so much. Before I say any more, I want you to think about this. So we've inherited, if we've inherited institutions that were all designed in the late 19th century for higher education and actually through K through 12 as well, if you were going to redesign education now, not for your past, but for your students' future, a world in which according to the US uh, Department of Labor Statistics, the average adult will change not jobs, but careers four to six times. The average adult now changes careers four to six times. Where if you're 15 years old, according to an Australian government survey, 65% of 15-year-olds of today will work in careers that haven't even been invented yet. Right? In that world, what would you do? What are your, th uh, write three things. I'm gonna set this for 90 seconds, I got a timer. Three things, what three institutional changes, what three changes would you make to your institution that would make it better able to prepare students for their future, not your past? What three institutional changes are most important to prepare students for their future? 90 seconds. There'll be a second part of this too. Okay, it's 90 seconds. I now would like you to turn to somebody, preferably you didn't, someone you didn't come in with, but that's fine if it's someone you did come in with. Now look at the six things on your two cards, <laughs> three people on, three on each card. I'd like you to talk together for 90 seconds and think of, and talk about the three things you each wrote and together decide on the one most important, the single most important institutional change to help prepare students for their future, not your past. The single one. Two people at work, to, two people to, together. Um, so, t so many things. I really wouldn't even have to give my talk now <laughs> because there's so, so many things that are interesting. First, I did not say in that first exercise to write those three, three things on a card, I did not say write by yourself and in silence. But if someone has a timer, and you have a pencil, and you have a paper, and you're told to come up with a smart idea, we've had 150 years to learn how to write, how to answer silently and alone. I was fortunate to teach in Japan in the 1980s, and the first time I told my very brilliant students at one of Japan's most famous women's colleges to do a complex task, they turned to one another. I was like, whoa, you're cheating. Don't do that. No, 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 I don't want you to talk to each other. And of course, they were brilliant students and wonderful young women, and they were shocked that I said they were cheating. And I said, so actually, actually tell me about why when I gave you a hard task, you turned to each other. My American students wouldn't do that. They would know to pick out their exam papers. Why did, and they said, because education is arranged in the Han, right? From the time that you're a small child in Japan, you're arranged in groups, not about disability, never. Always about what you can contribute to your group. So the smartest math person is put in a group with the smartest artist, artist and the smartest writer and the smartest, 
I don't know, geographer, geography person or, or musician. And when you set a problem, you know you can count on the other people in your group to together come up with an answer. That's how you do things. Not by, nobody says, you're the dumbest math person. They say, no, you're the smartest writer, so we want you in our group. So the Han is about using the best abilities collaboratively and collectively to contribute together. By the second time I taught in Japan in the 90s, when I told, asked my students the first time to do an assignment, I didn't have to tell them to write alone and silently. That, that educational message had transferred um, enough by that time that I didn't have to say it anymore. But we had to be taught that message, how to write alone and silently. If you'd ask Newton or Galileo or anyone in a previous century, before the last information age, they would have thought, well, if you're asked to give a hard task, of course you want to get the best minds involved and you want to have discussion and talk it through and then come up with an answer, which you may write in, maybe in your, alone in your study, but you wouldn't do it just alone. You would think about the wisdom of the ages and the wisdom of other people being able to contribute. So that's one interesting thing. Two, we're pretty good at being able to talk to one another, even in complex situations where we're making decisions when other people around us are talking. <coughs> but cognitive scientists would tell us that that's one of the most difficult things to do, and that's multitasking, and it somehow would be hurting our brains. No, we can do it. Okay? The whole multitasking issue is one of the most simplistic, historically obtuse um, arguments ever, and I'm happy to talk about that later. That's not the main focus of my talk today. But basically, multitasking is doing too much for what you can handle, and that varies tremendously. Uh, we know that heartache and heartburn, right, our physical woes and our emotional words are far more distracting than texting or email or anything else in the world. But when you're in a situation where you feel burdened, where you feel you have too many tasks, that's fantastic because usually our habits get us through and we miss a lot with our habits. We're pretty sloppy with our habits. They're efficient, but they're not very comp comprehensive. That's what habits are. They allow us to do things efficiently. So if we're feeling distracted instead of whining about it, I personally think we should say distraction is our friend and think, wow, what about this situation isn't working for me? If I'm lucky enough to be aware that I'm not paying attention, if I'm being disrupted from my habits, how lucky is that? How lucky is, it's culture shock, right? I don't have to tell this group how important culture shock is, right? You're in a situation of culture shock and you learn things you thought you knew very well and you have to realize you have to unlearn everything you thought you knew. Things you thought were human, right? When suddenly you're confronted in a very different set of cultures or certain circumstances, they're not human. They're culturally, historically determined and culturally and historically specific. But our habits prevent us from seeing that diversity until we're in a situation where our habits are disrupted. I think we should embrace that, that the methodology of distraction is, should be a method we embrace. No one in the 19th century would have said that. Because the 19th century had to make institutions to solve a problem. How in the world do you get people out of the farm into the factory? How in the world do you get shopkeepers into the corporation? Right? Think about the life of a farmer. Anyone here come from an agricultural background at all or know very anything about farming? Fewer and fewer. It's amazing to me how few, many, few people raise their hands when I ask that question. Look, just Bear with me, I bet this won't sound, we all read the storybooks about farms, right? Kids, uh, kids storybooks are often set on farms because they don't exist very much anymore in our lives. If you're a farmer, you don't care that it's eight o'clock in the morning. You care that the sun is up, right? You don't care what your to-do list is. If it's a sunny day, you might go about your to-do list. If it's pouring, you don't do that list, you come up with something else, right? Let's say it's a perfect day, I've got my to-do list, which is mend the fence that's been down. And I go out into my field to mend a fence, right? And there's one of my cows, tangled up in the barbed wire and their leg is mangle mangled. I will lose my farm if I say, I've gotta do my to-do list, right? I'm a monotasker. It says I've gotta fix the fence, of course not. I tend my cow, right? And if I don't know how to tend my cow, 
I say, wow, Farmer Smith is, a, is, is great at, at, at animal husbandry. I'm gonna go ask smart, Farmer Smith to take care of my cow, and in return, I'll not only fix my fence, but I'll fix his fence too, and all our cows will be safer. Right? That is such, can you imagine if people did that in factories? Can you imagine if every time you went to work in a factory or a corporation, you said, huh, I wonder what most needs doing today. Right? I wonder what, I, what, what do I think is the important thing to do. Right? Takes a tremendous amount of regulation and standardization to convince people that the way of the farmer is not the natural way and that the way of the factory is the natural way. How many people have come from backgrounds of small shopkeepers? Have family with parents who owned small businesses or small, okay. The small business person isn't so much different than the farmer, right? You are constantly multitasking. There's constantly disruptions and you will lose your business if you don't respond to the crisis. If I'm a restaurant owner, right? And I think I'm gonna have this menu tonight and then I find out there's no fish at the market today, I change my menu. If a sewer pipe is broken or, or my staff doesn't come in or my chef calls in sick, I better attend to that before I go to my to-do list, right? Or it, or it fails. Right? I didn't read all of the archives of compulsory education, but I read a lot of them. Many of them still exist. It's a long, long time in the US from Miss Massachusetts to Mississippi, 1815 to 1982, between the first and the last law that requires compulsory tax-supported tax public education. But in almost all of them, timeliness and attention to task are the justification for raising taxes to pay for public education for everybody as a national or state good. These words I've translated to a more uh, 21st century vocabulary, but these are the kinds of concepts that are everywhere in the documents about compulsory education. How to teach kids to be timely. And it's amazing the level of detail some of the, the legislation has. Things like every child will start school at a certain age. And often that age is prescribed to the month, you know, by the sixth month of the sixth year, for example. How many kids here have, how many people here have kids? Okay. A lot of you have had kids, and every one of you has been a kid, right? You know that not every child is ready for first grade at six years and six months, and some kids were ready at four years. But interestingly, it is very important in the 19th century rules on pu compulsory public education that every child start at the same time. The other thing that's mandated, the segmenting of knowledge into fields that are taught in a very prescriptive order. 8 a.m. to 9, oh, the other one. Why is the school bell the symbol of the 19th century? Timeliness, right? You come to school when the bell rings. You all start at the same time. Eight till nine o'clock is gonna be math. Nine o'clock, put away the math books, take out the spelling books. Doesn't matter if you were having the most exciting math lesson in the world or if nobody got it. It's nine o'clock. Put away the math books, take out the spelling books. Can you think of any other human learning except school learning that would possibly go that way, right? If you're teaching your child how to walk, okay, now we're gonna do crawling. Okay, nine o'clock, stop crawling. Now we're gonna try holding onto chairs. Okay, 10 o'clock, no more holding onto chair, right? Tennis lessons, golf lessons, think about it. We don't learn any way like that except in school, why? Institutions tend to create the, pre preserve the problems they were designed to solve. Public education was designed to solve the problem of how to get people from the farm to the factory, from the shop to the corporation. Standardization of human nature, attention to task, timeliness, segmenting of knowledge into subjects, coming up with ways of certifying excellence in very prescribed ways, setting the credentials, setting the terms of accreditation. Hierarchy, teacher here, really hard for teacher to get away from the mic, right, from, from the podium. If Ichabod Crane came in now, right? Electricity, what's that? Computer, what's that? Podium, ha, I know what this is, right? We wouldn't have to tell Ichabod Crane where to stand. He would know exactly where he stood 
and what he stood for and what his standing was in this room, right? With no conversation. We wouldn't have to tell him a thing. He would know exactly how to do that. Two cultures, again, Galileo, Leonardo, Newton. There's no one before the 19th century who would have thought you would divide the world of science and technology from the world of society, creativity, the arts, innovation, writing, communication. Are science and technology really that trivial that you would marginalize them in that way? Really? Okay. Interesting. William James, the great philosopher, he's often called the, modern, the father of modern, modern psychology, he was also a philosophy professor at Harvard, was the first person in English to write about attention. He whines about it. He says, how come nobody else writes about what the French call distraction? 1890, what the French call distraction. Now the word distraction had entered English before then, but not in the sense he meant of, I have a task, something externally distracts me from that task. He had to go to the French to come up even for a word for this thing that's now, we're also convinced is part of our cognitive abilities, right, monotasking. He had to go to the French to find that word. One of his, um, somebody uh, who was an informal disciple of James, Frederick Winslow Taylor, the father of scientific management theory, scientific uh, management, I'm sorry, scientific labor management, blah, blank for a second. He was the Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs of his era. He was on his way to Harvard from a very famous, very wealthy Philadelphia blue line, blue main line? mainline family, and decided manufacturing was the key to the future. Dropped out and went and took a job in a pig iron factory. His family was very upset. But he said, actually, if we apply James's work to the factory, we can not only standardize labor, we can standardize the laborer. And he, Taylor came up with many theories about how, what we could do to standardize human being human behavior, how we could find ways to measure human behavior in as efficient, scientific, a metric as we did for the actual pro pro the products that were being play re um, produced by human labor. I love this quote because everyone looks at it and says, well, that's easy to figure out the answer. How long does it take? What he was getting at is what about the fact that when you're pushing that wheelbarrow of loose dirt in the morning, when you've had a full night's sleep and a good breakfast, push it faster than at night. That's bad, right? He came up with systems to reward the worker who pushed the wheelbarrow at the same rate at 8 a.m. as they did at 5 p.m. after having done it all day. In fact, if you could do it at the same speed all day long, you were considered a soldier and you got a merit increase. And if you didn't, you were considered a malingerer and you got a demerit, right? That's not human or natural. Right? There's some, it was a, stan a way of standardizing human behavior. And what was the mechanism for that standardization? Here we are, it was education. <laughs> I thought I was a genius when I came up with the idea that scientific labor management, basically between about 1890 and 1915, becomes scientific learning management. I thought I'd invented this. Then I gave a talk at Dartmouth where they said, well, you know, Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth is the first graduate school of business. I said, sure, everyone knows that. They said, you know who our first professor was? I said, no, who? They said, Frederick Winslow Taylor. <laughs> so here I thought I'd invented it. No, it's actually true. Taylor taught in the first school, was the first full professor in the first school of business and taught scientific labor management as an educational and business philosophy. I could go on about any of these, for each of these could be a book, and each of these has been a book, but I want to just talk about two, my two favorite things here. The ones in red, in red grades and multiple choice tests. Mount Holyoke <laughs> College is the first institution of higher education in America to go from long written comments on people's work, whether it's algebra or poetry, to A, B, C, D, scientific grading, it was called. The second institution in America to adopt scientific grading was the American Meatpackers Association. 
Interestingly, I'm an archivist, so I went back and looked at some of the transcripts from the American Meat Packers Association, and there were a lot of people who were very, very upset that you would think, that you'd have the audacity to think you could reduce sirloin and chuck to an ABCD grade. And in fact, from the very beginning, they have written comments that go along with ABCD grades in the American Meat Packers Association. Meanwhile, educators didn't seem to think it was a problem, because virtually every university K through 12 starts adopting ABCD grading as its way of scientifically grading student work. Think about Newton and Galileo and da Vinci and all those folks again who would have thought, really? Really, at a university, you're gonna take the complexity of ideas and reduce it to ABCD grading? Okay. Multiple choice tests. Frederick Kelly, 1914, he's in a crisis. The pop immigrant population of America has increased by 300%. A new law says you have to stay in school till you're 16, which means high school is no longer just for people going on to college, but for the masses. And it's World War I. Men are at war, women are in the factories. There are no teachers. So Kelly says, well, our friend Henry Ford is turning out Model Ts on an assembly line in a standardized way. You don't have to be a craftsman to make a Model T. How can we get students through our educational system without the craftsmen known as teachers? Because we don't have any, we have a shortage. So he says, I've got an idea. We're gonna invent this thing called the multiple choice test, standardized testing. Because you can make a grade sheet and put it over the test and anybody can grade the test. You don't need professional teachers. Anyone can grade the test, All right? Draw a line around the word cow. No other answer is right. This is from his dissertation at Kansas State University in 1914. Stop at once when time is called. Do not open papers until told, so that all may begin at the same time. Right? It's not so different <coughs> from no child left behind, end of grade, required testing. Right? Let me tell you a question from Kelly's dissertation. Which of these four animals is a farm animal? A, dog. B, cow. C, dinosaur. D, hippopotamus, right? If you're a farm kid, you might think dog is, a, is the right answer, right? Dogs on farms, you can't have a farm without a dog. That is the wrong answer. Why? Because the answer isn't about the complexity of thinking, it's about coming up with the situationally right answer that's standardized and expected of the test. That's what standardized teaching is, that's what teaching to the test is. It's the opposite of service learning, right? The opposite of taking a theory and applying it to a real world situation. It's the opposite of the real world, right? It's about standardizing not just bodies, but minds to a certain kind of thinking. If I, my kid comes home today and had a dog wrong and was crying because his teacher said dog was not a farm animal, and I said, well, what, am I a good parent? What would I do? I'd say, well, let's Google it and find out what a farm animal is. Do you have any idea how many answers there'd be? How many Google responses there'd be to farm animals? 12,900,000 answers, right? So our kids are going to this world of ABCD testing and they're at home living in a world of 12,900,000 responses to what is a farm animal. What's wrong with this picture, right? If you go to the number one, number one site under farm animals, I don't know if this this is true right now because it changes, but this, uh, several times when I've gone to it, this is the one. There's a great site called Farm Kids, which is written by educators, except the longer you're on the slight site, the slower and sludgier it gets till finally a pop-up comes and says, hey kids, are you using Internet Explorer, whatever, 4.0? If not, please ask mom to download the most recent Internet Explorer. And if you go into the guts of the program, it turns out it's designed not to work well with Apple products, with the Mozilla open source browser. It's a Microsoft advertisement, right? So in what world do we live in? Do, and you know, how does ABCD grading possibly work for our kids in a world of $12,900,000 answers, $12, answers and the number one answer is a commercial, right? Where are we teaching them how to respond critically to the world they live in? Where are we teaching them how to make and contribute to content in the world they live in? 
Here's one of the cartoons from my young friend, Nick Susanus. This all takes place in boxes for efficient transmission from sender to receiver. Enclosures become internalized. What was outside is replicated within. Uh, Nick is a comic artist. I myself am one of those people who's never read comics. I don't understand it. And I have the huge privilege like, right now. I'm so happy. Nick and I are writing a book together as a comic for young people. It is so exciting. Talk about having the boxes in your brain totally just, you know, because his idea is that there's the really exciting thing that happens in comics, and I never understood this. I'm just learning it now. I've actually been taking drawing lessons, and I'm really, I'm, I won't do the final drawing, but I'm trying to learn to think like a comic artist. His idea is between the words and the images, so much is going on. It's an incredibly creative process. It's not a one-to-one -one mapping. No good comic artist translates drawings into words or words into drawings. There's, it's the tension, the space between where things happen. It is so exciting to be writing a book. We're calling, calling it, I think, uh, Changing Higher Ed to Change the World or Learning the Future Together. I'm not sure. We haven't decided yet if it's going to be for high school and college students or just college or whatever. We're, we're just at the beginning. But it's so exciting to learn to think in this new dimension. Shifting the paradigm. I think as teachers that probably this room knows more about this than most educators, but that you've got a long road to hoe, especially if funding is going to be cut to service learning, as some of us fear, um, national funding for support for service learning pro programs. Because I think the whole paradigm of education has to be turned into a service learning paradigm. Um, I'm probably not going to talk about it entire, uh, at length here, but one of the things I'm working on is a new uh, paradigmatic program called um, the Startup Core Curriculum, where no, there's no final exams. It's taking theoretical interdisciplinary problem-based, project-based learning and making it work. And you, your exam and your graders at the exams are the community you work with who says, yeah, they, were, they thought they knew everything, they sure didn't know. They weren't listening to us. That didn't work, right? All of those things that you learn in service learning, I don't think education should be done until you can learn that. And if you're living in a world where 65% of you are going to be in careers that aren't invented yet, and you're going to change your career four to six times in the course of a life, you better learn to learn that way, right? One of the, tra I've, as I mentioned, I've given 66 talks this year, and I try to alternate K through 12 universities nonprofits, corporations, accreditation, and technology places. Whenever I talk to management trainers at, at corporations, they say it's harder. Here in this job market where they can hire anybody, right? Their students are gods, straight A students with every imaginable credential. I said it's taking longer than ever to train them for the work world. Why? Because they've been reared in a world where failure means getting the wrong answer. In the world of work, failure is, no, is not knowing how to get the right answer. Huge paradigmatic difference, right? Because to get the right answer requires you to know you don't what you don't know, to know you're lost, to find out how you can work with somebody else who might be able to contribute when you don't know the answer. And trainers say it takes a year to take the best students and convince the best students, not only that they don't know the right answers, and I often have great, these trainers often feel great sympathy. But the students are terrified, terrified to admit they have a wrong answer. Because they've given, th gone, th gone through a world where one wrong answer means you might not go to graduate school. You might not go to medical school, right? If you don't know the right answer, you've taken lots of after school tests to learn how to fake the right answer. Right? You have the skill of faking the right answer. Disaster in the real world. Right? We know. Right? Our economic crisis, some people could argue, is uh, actually there's a wonderful book by Karen Ho called Liquidated that basically says our financial crisis is because of a whole generation of, of young people who are really convinced, young hedge funders who are convinced that the thing to do is if you didn't know the right answer, fake it. Yeah. At someone else's expense. Keywords for our age. Workflow. Multitasking attention. Iterative process. 
In all my classes now, I have students do, I come up with elaborate ways where my students do something, present it to their classmates, get form, formal feedback, and then do it again. And then sometimes repeat the process. But everything is a process and everything is about getting feedback. I'm also convinced all these shows, like So You Think You Can Dance and even American Idol, the, quiz, the, the big competitive shows, are partly because we have young people starving for a world that models feedback. Because we are, our ABCD world is terrible at modeling feedback. It models standardized measuring of, a, of testing, but terrible at modeling how you get something somewhat right and someone corrects you and then you get to show how well you do it the next time? Think we have to go to reality TV? Wow. For what education lacks? Interesting. Collaboration by difference. My organization, Haystack, is based on the principle of collaboration by difference. Whenever we do a project, we try to put together scientists who know nothing about the arts with artists who know nothing about science with humanists and social scientists and work on a project together and we put end users, the community that's gonna be served in the design phase of the process. Uh, when we run meetings, we often will invite people to the meetings, give them a free lunch on the condition that they sit in our meetings for 20 minutes and then tell us what we're missing. People who know nothing about what we do. It always seems like it's a little crazy that it may be as somebody from the housekeeping staff or from a completely different program on campus or somebody from the community that's coming to one of our business meetings. We always learn something we never, 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 never would have come up with on our own by having someone completely out, so outside our world, give us just a fresh opinion on what our world is. But we never build that into expertise. If the 19th century was taking us from the farm to the factory, from the firm to the, uh, from the shop to the firm, how do we prepare a world where even on the industrial level, on the, menu, on the most basic level, we're getting factory to call center, firm to startup? Um, I did some ethnographies at call centers and learned that most of them have automated systems that say if a customer hangs up before you hang up, you get fired. That's the way they've automated customer service. Interesting, because I don't know about you, but I've hung up. I think I've got, I was kind of shocked when I learned that, because I thought, oh my goodness, I've, some people have lost their job because of me, right? But think about that. You're dealing with, you're supposed to be dealing with real humans. That's a very different skill, even for this, these terrible jobs. People work in sweatshop conditions under very, very poor conditions. Even those terrible jobs are about human interaction. And how do you train for the startup? Where does traditional education fit? Where does it fit in a world where our, student, our, our students at home are doing all kinds of creative things and doing all kinds of learning, online and in the real world? Um, I love the Radiohead one that um, was this kind of crowdsourced global health solution. People working together face-to-face -to -face and online, using online to organize face-to-face -face and vice versa. Flipping the classroom, is that a term people are familiar with in, here, in this? You know, the flipped classroom, people keep talking about MOOCs, multiple, mul massive online open classrooms. Gosh, I mean, I t I, because I was traveling to 66 events this year, um, I used to do, play this thing called Galaxy Zoo. Does anyone know Galaxy Zoo? It's a crowdsourced, um, project by the American Astronomical Association, International Astronomical Association that you just flip up and it'll show you a galaxy and you identify the features of the galaxy and they're actually crowdsourcing a new kind of astronomy by having all of us see things that professional astronomers can't see anymore because of their own habits. Um, but they've, they've, they've done so much on that, they've, it, it, they're redoing the site now. So I've started taking online courses. So I've learned, this year I've learned some statistics, some JavaScript, Humiliating. I haven't done code since Fortran, so JavaScript was pretty embarrassing. Um, human computer interaction, a Stanford class. Um, moonwalking, not in airports. Um, uh, handwriting, because I'm working on comic art, I'm with a comic artist, and so he has to be able to read my handwriting. That's a hard one. Wow, to go back and relearn how to do handwriting. Uh, three point perspective. So I just kind of, when I'm in planes, I learn how to do stuff and I go to a lot of online classes. A lot of online classes are horrible, right? They're like the worst, most boring professor, only now they're on the screen, right? The only good part of it 
is unlike the most boring professors you can fast forward on the screen, which is a blessing. On the other hand, my Carnegie Mellon statistics class, the fifth time I got an answer wrong, said, hey, Kathy, cheeky, hey, Kathy, do you know that you respond much better when you make a mistake, we correct the mistake, and then we tell you what we corrected, than if you make a mistake and we tell you how to correct it? I've been teaching, I consider myself a pretty good teacher. I've been teaching about teaching for a long time. I did not know that about my own teaching style. It took a machine to tell me that because it had seen hundreds of thousands of people make mistakes and was able to crunch that data and actually give me feedback about my teaching. That's pretty cool. And there's a huge, huge range. But I think we shouldn't just be flipping a classroom. To have kids teaching on, to learning online is not really what we can do as teachers. And again, I don't need to tell this to this room. I think we shouldn't be making flipping classes. The, if you don't know the phrase, flipping classroom means students learn online and then they, come, they do their homework before the class. They learn online, then they come to class and talk to the teacher one-on-one -on -one about problems. It's a start, but I think a really poor start. And I've been very lucky to work with the MacArthur Foundation on something called the Digital Media and Learning Initiative, where we give funding every year to interesting projects um, that are really pushing the boundaries of new forms of learning. And I call this cartwheeling because it's not just flipping. It's like turning and turning. And you know what a cartwheel's like. Do you ever, does everyone remember the first time they did a cartwheel? Wow, right? You can go upside down and go upright again. And you can go upside down and go upright again. That's a cool metaphor. Here, are, these are two of the projects um, that we funded in Mac through MacArthur. And both of them relate, have college professors, college students, working with high school teachers in high schools and communities. My favorite is this one on the right called, uh, or one of my favorites is Black Cloud. Students at Berkeley and professors at Berkeley created this thing called Cloudy, which is about, uh, about it's the size of an iPhone and about the thickness of 10 iPhones. You can <coughs> put Cloudy on the wall and it would tell you every toxic chemical in this room. Um, Artists worked on the design of it. It's very cute. Um, engineers worked on the processing of, the, of the, the mechanics of it. They partnered with LA uh, Manual Arts High School in Los Angeles. And the kids came up with experiments. One of the experiments I love um, was they put Cloudy in the parking garage of the LA Symphony. Lots of chemicals. And then the kids said, hey, what if we also put it in the symphony hall? And guess what the teacher said? The teacher said, well, you know, everyone's all cleaned up and in good, you know, they're all fancy on opening night in the symphony hall. Why, why would you do that? Can you guess? And I've set this up, so I, I'm sure you're all guess right. Where do you think there are more toxic chemicals? The symphony hall by far. Because all those things we wash and dress and put on our bodies to look great are pretty darn toxic, right? So the LA kids, these sixth graders, wrote a, a paper about it that was then published in a scientific journal and presented it to the LA Commission to talk about, because they're not interested in pollution and polar bears drowning. They're interested in their kid friends who are dying of asthma, right? It's a worldwide epidemic. Every kid knows a kid who's dying of asthma. This was like a great project for that to me and I guess I don't have to tell this room, right? That to me is what all education, that's what the core curriculum of every university should look like, right? How you take multiple perspectives, multiple kinds of knowledge, solve a problem, but actually work with communities. Also teaching, the whole point of working with high school kids is everybody knows the college kids are gonna learn more if they're teaching, the, teaching what they know to the high school kids. The high school kids are learning more because they're writing to the LA County, uh, County um, uh, Board of whatever it is, um, you know, the, uh, what am I trying to say, the commission. It's amazing to think about how much our learning in school has been partitioned off one learner from another, one expert from another, our schools from the world, um, and how much 
our institutions were designed for those kinds of separation. I teach a bunch of crazy courses at Duke. I'm not going to take your time um, talking about them. But the most exciting thing is next year we're starting something called a PhD lab in digital knowledge, where people that are going to be going out to be teaching, especially in the human and social sciences, are going to really be thinking in terms of collaborative thinking, new methods of thinking, new modes of thinking, what a cartwheeled classroom can look like. That's exciting to me, really exciting to me. And my friend Nick Sussanis is going to be writing, uh, he's turning it in in September, the first dissertation about comics written as a comic. Um, he said, how can I write about comics in words? Um, we were lucky, he came to one of our Haystack meetings, he said, I've almost got this approved, but there's still the provost hasn't quite approved it. I said, provost of Columbia? I think we know some, some of us know the provost of Columbia. And we were able to write saying how bold and exciting this would be. I don't know if it made a difference, but it's been approved, his dissertation's been approved. So he's actually writing the first Columbia University dissertation about comics that's actually written as a comic. And he teaches classes in comics at Columbia, pretty cool. I think if we professors can be replaced by a computer screen, we should be. <laughs> Everybody freaks out when I say that, because sometimes people think, oh, we should, that sh Davidson is saying we should replace professors with computer screens. Uh-uh. I'm saying, if we're doing such a poor job of interaction, interacting with the knowledge we are privileged to have and be sharing, that we can be replaced by online courses. Online courses are cheaper and they reach more people. Get rid of us. The converse of that, the inverse of that is we need to be adding something, and again, I don't need to tell the people in this room, all of our education should be adding something that no computer can replicate. That is service learning in the widest sense of the word. That is applied learning. Taking an idea, translating that idea, whether it's online to your online communities that you live in 80 hours a week, according to most recent statistics, or that are the communities you live in in the real world and the interesting conduits one from the other. Uh, friends of mine are involved in protesting the recent firing of the president at University of Virginia, uh, which you may know, recent emails that they've gotten through the Freedom of Information Act reveal that the big issue was the president, who'd only been president of UVA for two years, two years, um, hadn't yet turned all the classes into online classes, and this was terrible that she hadn't yet turned them into online classes. So she was fired, uh, or for, no, that's not true. Her resignation was requested, and in a situation where she was told the board, which turns out not to be true, but turns out that the board had, had unanimously said she should step down, she tendered her resignation. Well, as one of my friends said on Twitter, they did this on a weekend in June, forgetting that we know a lot about online education. Faculty immediately and students immediately Twittered this, uh, tweeted this out and in instantly had 800 people at a meeting to protest that firing. You can't fire people in June anymore thinking that no one will know about it, <laughs> right? It was real bodies connected. Actually, the student newspaper at the University of Virginia is doing the best, and best, better investigative reporting than the New York Times has done in the last 10 years. I mean, they are doing great <coughs> work. These kids, the students at the University of Virginia in this situation are learning more about the power of the press and the importance of a free press than they could learn in any other way. Maybe the best unintended consequence of this. But of course, people were organizing, using Twitter and email to organize real life um, events. And no one knows how this is gonna unfold. Institutional change. I started with Clay Shirky. Institutions tend to preserve the problems they were designed, to, created to solve. Thomas Friedman recently has said, Big breakthroughs happen when what is suddenly possible meets what is desperately necessary. I think we are in that moment. We are in that moment when the suddenly possible is meeting the des desperately necessary. We are in that moment where everyone knows, everyone knows our institutions of education are not working. They are not working. IBM invented the punch clock. 40% of IBM workers use a punch clock now. How, why does time, timeliness, standardization possibly matter in a world of endeavor-based work of the only massive manufacturing company of the 19th century to survive into the 21st? They almost failed, they almost went under 
in the 1990s and then realized we have to reconceptualize. They have innovation challenges. 10,000 people from IBM meet online to talk about how to make sustainable environments in the new city that sprung up in, in China that's serving IBM workers or that includes IBM workers, migrant workers that are coming to a city. A city. They are crowdsourcing. They're <coughs> doing what most higher education hasn't figured out how to do yet. You have. When we were running the, the uh, competition for the MacArthur Foundation, the president of the MacArthur Foundation asked David Thiel Goldberg and me, the other co-creator of Haystack. Haystack now has nine, about 9,000 members. It's free. Anyone can sign up. He said, how would you define institutions? And we said, we want to do something really different. Instead of institutions being barriers, let's think of institutions as mobilizing networks. Because within every institution that seems solid, go to any faculty lounge. We're all complaining, right? Right? Nobody's happy. How can you mobilize those individuals brought together by institutions even when we're grumpy about the institutions we serve? That to me is the challenge of our era. How do we take what we know that's different from what our institutions are trying to preserve in order to help our institutions survive into the 21st century? I don't think that's an easy task. I don't minimize that task. But I also think if we don't take the responsibility, if we really believe our institutions are all powerful, if we fail to realize our role as actors within our institutions, we're missing something incredibly vital and important. We should be replaced by computer screens. If we're not working for institutional change, and you know it, right? You are the ser people who know how important services and global relations and global partnerships are. If we don't know how you take the marginal and make it the center, who will, right? We have more expertise than most of our colleagues who are considered the experts in their field. Again, I don't minimize how hard that is. It's very hard, but if we don't do it, who will? And I think it's necessary. One more cartoon from my friend Nick. Consider education as a series of experiences our path curved by the gravitational influence of encounters along our way. I've said all I want to say. I'd love to hear what's on your card.